Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, we're going to get started. So I'm going to ask that Leah with the Kivera Coalition take over on admitting people. And I'm going to go ahead and do the introduction. My name is Adrienne Rosenberg, and I live in Embudo, which is, uh, if anybody doesn't know, just less than a mile away from Dixon, where you're often considered part of Dixon, but um, we are also part of the lower Embudo watershed that Jan Villem will be speaking to today. And you're in the second installment of the soil health webinars that Jan Villem is putting on. Um, and this series is through a grant, the Healthy Soils Act, and Jan Villem will speak a little more to that. I want to go over some of the Zoom uh, I guess, ins and outs, it'll just be a quick one. So if whoever's in charge of the, there we go. Thank you, Jan Bill. <laughs> uh, so a few things, you'll see at the bottom of your screen that there are um, some buttons. And with the Zoom, webinar we're going to do a series of powerpoints that Jan Vilm will be um, flipping through and speaking to. Unfortunately you won't be able to see him. It was the easiest way to do this. As we all know technology is a little bit tricky these days. You will see me though so um, I'll be the face kind of there uh, filling in for Jan Vilm. So those buttons on the bottom there's a mute button which I'll mute right now. Hear me? As you can see, you couldn't hear me and there was a little uh, red X through the microphone next to my picture. If you can all keep yourselves on mute throughout the whole webinar, that would be fantastic. At the end, we're gonna have a question and answer session um, for the last 10 minutes and I'll talk about that in a moment, but that'll be your opportunity to take yourself off mic and ask some questions. Um, let's see. We will have a halftime question answer session. That one, if you can, as we go through all the slides and anything comes to mind, you can type in your chat box. That's the, let's see, one, two, three, four, fifth button over on the bottom of your screen. And you just make sure it's to everyone and then type in your question. If it's something that myself or Leah can answer easily, we'll type back to you. And if not, I'll save it to the halfway point to ask on Willem during that question and answers or to the end um, question and answer session. If you're on a phone, you can mute and unmute yourself with star six. The camera is the next button I'm going to talk about. That is something where you, if you don't wanna be seen, you can click on that and it'll stop your video. We are doing this in a recording. So we, you will be seen publicly and your voice will be heard publicly if you choose to speak at that end session. So just keep that in mind, um, whether you wanna have that publicly seen or not. And if not, just type in the chat box your questions. Let's see, what else? Tech support will be provided by Leah. And the number is right here, 505-393-1355. It'll be on every slide at the bottom, so don't fret. You don't have to write it down. Um, it will be there. If you need any help, if something's not making sense, just call her and she'll be able to help you. And let's see. I think that's it. I just wanted to thank Jan Willem. This has been a great opportunity to learn alongside him and help him out um, with somewhere that I think is really special and also shows a lot of different um, soil potentials. And so I'm excited just as you are to see this second webinar. So thank you all for coming and we'll get started. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. And Thank you, Leah, for helping here. Uh, this is Jan Willem Janssens. Um, I am going back to the first screen to uh, introduce myself and the, and the presentation today. Um, I'm the owner of Ecotone Landscape Planning here in Santa Fe, and I work across northern New Mexico, uh, pretty much between, say, Albuquerque and the Colorado border on um, Oh, probably about a dozen projects every year uh, related to ecological restoration and land management planning. And I come to this work as a landscape planner, actually uh, graduated in the Netherlands from an agricultural university with a degree in landscape architecture. 
uh, and specialized in watershed management planning, ecological restoration, and ecological engineering. And uh, I've been working in the lower Embudo Valley for about 10 years on watershed planning, woodland restoration, erosion control. And that led me, of course, to uh, this work uh, because erosion control has to do a lot with soil and uh, soil and water conservation are other words for, uh, you could say, erosion control. And uh, looking at soil more in depth, uh, literally and figuratively, has been really a joy. And uh, through this yeah, webinar sorry. program, I, I learned a lot and uh, have been able to uh, synthesize it to, to share a little bit of it. Um, so I want to thank a couple people. I already mentioned Adrian and Leah of the Quivira Coalition and uh, Adrian as a, uh, a friend and colleague in, in Dixon. Uh, this uh, program uh, would not have been possible also with the generous uh, grant support from the New Mexico Department Agri of Agriculture uh, and its Soil Health Program and also uh, the Embudo Valley Library and Community Center. Uh, which uh, serves as a fiscal agent and supporter in the community. So in this webinar, and in actually the series of webinars, I will introduce the critical importance of soil in holding water and as the natural growing medium for plants and many other forms of life, as you will discover in this presentation. And uh, we'll see how soil is self-generating and self-healing. and at least if it's not overstressed, and that there are possibilities of healing soil based on that self-healing capacity. We will see that soil is a living ecosystem that we need to really take care of with attention and dedication in, in order to allow it to come to its fullest potential. And that potential for us is, of course, in having it harvest and store water and support plant life and provide many other services that we often take for granted. And I really believe that once we take care of the soil, we'll really discover how healthy soil can provide for us and how it supports us individually and as a community. So, um, and that will generate a lot of benefits in the order of uh, sustained plant productivity, uh, better wildlife, livestock forage, pignon nut crops, uh, firewood supplies, wildlife habitat, agricultural crops. And we may also expect greater tree resilience and uh, during drought and insect outbreaks, for example. So let's uh, look at what this webinar is going to, uh, to do. It's part of a series, as you see. There are two more coming up. And uh, each of the webinars will provide an overview of uh, the previous webinars so that you have a sense of at least not having missed something because they all build on each other. Uh, but I make sure that they're also standing on themselves so that everybody can jump in uh, in this series at any time. So this webinar today will focus on uh, restoring soil health in the degraded upland areas around Dixon. Um, we'll uh, talk about this area, the Lower Ambudo Valley, with its different landscape types. We're talking about what soil really is and how soil is an entire ecosystem in itself. Uh, we'll review signs of soil degradation, soil erosion, and review the Healthy Soil Program's five Healthy Soil Principles. And then we'll do a brief, maybe five minute Q&A session um, about that and dive deeper into the topic for today, which is on soil degradation causes and processes, but also about soil healing, erosion control techniques, and how you do that specifically for very degraded uh, upland areas. And I call uplands areas that are not irrigated, that are uh, somewhat wild, you could say, and uh, of which we have a lot in New Mexico and also around Dixon. And then we will end our uh, session today 
with question and answers and maybe a discussion if time allows and a quick look forward to the next webinar. And we'll ask you again to do an evaluation uh, which we will, for which we will send you a link so that we can learn uh, how this went today. All right, our focus area is still the Lower Embudo Valley. That's basically the focus area for this entire series. And it's interesting because there are so many different landscape types and uh, land uses there. And it is part of a larger um, program of watershed restoration, of which you will hear more later during this webinar. Um, the Lower Embudo Valley is, in fact, the area here on your screen, uh, and for those who don't have a screen who call in, I hope you have access to the PowerPoint that was sent out. Um, so it is basically the area bounded by the Rio Grande at the downstream end and Picoris Pueblo on the uh, far eastern end just off the screen and the mesas uh, to the north and the south here uh, pretty much at the edges of the map. Um, the area's geology consists of rocks formed by volcanoes and sediment deposits and are uh, quite old, um, from 1.8 billion to 3 million years old. And uh, then, of course, at the foot of all those rock masses, it's a lot of sediment from the last thousands of years and maybe the day before yesterday, you could say. And over time, ancient versions of the watershed streams have carved the valleys that are so characteristic now in this landscape. Um, and around Dixon and towards the Rio Grande, uh, it is so badly eroded, these, these valleys have so badly eroded over the last several hundreds of thousands of years that they form what is called badlands. Um, and those are all the very fine uh, shaded squiggles that you can see on the map because that basically indicates the high level of um, uh, topography that you have there as a result of the erosion. And not much can be done with the badlands because they're so actively erosing, eroding still. Much of the watershed has a clay-like soil material actually with very low permeability, um, little to no vegetation and deeply cut drainage systems except in the alluvial area along the Rio Embudo that you see here in uh, hash blue color where it is irrigated land. Um, and at several locations, the stream, the Rio Embudo, um, passes through very narrow uh, box canyons or cliff, cliffs. And uh, these narrows uh, give this landscape its name because Embudo is funnel in Spanish. And we're going to look at several of those uh, a, li a little late, later on in the presentation. Okay, let's uh, move on. So here's a cross section of this landscape um, that is kind of, um, you could say, a model of how a, a lot of uh, northern New Mexico landscapes are, but also specifically here at the Embudo Valley where you have the Sierra, uh, which is the higher mountainous area or mesa areas. Um, in this case, owned by the Forest Service, managed by the Forest Service and covered with forests. Uh, and they're mostly uh, hard rock uh, in terms of soil, exposed rock material with a very thin layer of soil. Then immediately below that are the Montes, which are uh, rangelands and woodlands. In this case, around Dixon, managed and owned by the Bureau of Land Management and the state, uh, uh, their state trust lands. The state land office uh, is managing those. And they're on lower mesas and crests, and, and they have stony slopes and sediment fans and many arroyos. And there, there is a mixture of hard rock, boulder slopes, sandy and loamy sediment, stone fields, and gravelly and sandy arroyos. Then below that um, is more of a sedimentary area. Um, it includes part of the village, some dry farming, but actually mostly some private land, some public land, um, and 
areas that are not really actively used or maybe for recreation. Uh, a lot of sandy and gravelly mounds and sand and gravel arroyos. And then you really get lower down into the village area uh, with the first acequias. And uh, they have been called the acequia alta and altitos in this kind of a model. Um, it's the beginning of irrigated land with gardens. Much of the land is private. There are more loamy slopes and uh, some sandy loam. Below that, the La Jolla, which high, with high quality irrigated land, it's all private clay loam slopes and uh, loam and clay and clay loam along narrow arroyos. And below that, sometimes another arroyo, uh, acequia that feeds the lower part of the landscape um, with farms, orchards, and pasture, also mostly private uh, on lower slopes that are nearly flat, often with clay soils, sometimes with sediment fans and some arroyos that still go through this landscape as narrow drainage channels or canals almost uh, that drain excess water into the river. And then finally, the Cienega and Bosque and the river uh, with some wetlands uh, in recent years, definitely supported by beaver. I'm not sure whether they're still there. Uh, it's, uh, the stream uh, volume is very low right now. It's private. And uh, some parcels are actually owned by BLM. Um, there are some loamy depressions, some sandy areas and banks. Uh, there is the cobbly, sometimes sandy riverbed. And uh, it's a mixture of different uh, soil types. We're going to focus today on the area uh, here with this big red bracket, uh, which I would call for now the erosion control area. Um, a part of the Lower Montes and the Secano area. Um, this is highly erosive, and uh, but also receiving sediment from the higher up landscape. And it is actually where restoration work can be done because the higher landscape is so inaccessible and steep. And uh, the erosion there is largely part of natural conditions that are very hard to mitigate. So it is in this lower area uh, that actually work can be done. So our focus area here, this erosion control area, has actually somewhat of a, a, a funnel shape. If you would imagine um, that drainages uh, looking down on them as a watershed have a funnel shape. Um, so that they have a water collection area, like a bowl almost, in which water flows down from the slopes to the drainage, to the arroyo. And then the arroyo itself is like a funnel spout that carries that water uh, farther down and as a conveyance zone in the landscape. And those terms are important to realize. And each little drainage in itself is like uh, the funnel bowl in which water is being collected and then the arroyo with its spout or conveyance zone that carries that water uh, down to another arroyo and so on. And, uh, and it's important to identify where you can work in the landscape by understanding uh, the shapes and where water flows. Let's go and take a look at that landscape. So here are these montes areas, and you can see how eroded they are in uh, small narrow valleys the slopes of which form that bowl that I spoke of, uh, that almost form uh, a funnel shape, a V-shape, and then the arroyos being the little spout of the funnel, right? And um, these areas, especially the steeper ones, are still very hard to work in. I wouldn't advise people to actually take that on, although that's where a lot of the erosion actually takes place. And then here, the lower areas, where actually there is a mixture of uh, the rock materials and the sediment, uh, that's where actually a lot of work can be done. And where also plant growth is much more prolific and can be stimulated again. And then in the bottom right picture, or the, the picture to the right, you see in the bottom actually how that arroyo flows there um, with the arroyo banks and everything. And behind it actually in the picture 
you see how that area has been treated. Um, it has been thinned and the branches have been spread, uh, making that area much greener uh, because it has stimulated plant, plant growth in the openings and in the shade of the thin material, the slash. And then here are what I would call the funnel spouts, uh, the uh, arroyos um, that are definitely an important part of that Secano area. Um, on the left top, you see an arroyo that has been treated as well with a small structure and a big floodplain with sediment. Uh, below it, actually a wetland. There are many small pocket wetlands in this landscape and they are excellent locations where you can do restoration work because they have a natural water holding capacity. And uh, to hold those wetlands is essential because therefore you hold up the elevation of the soil behind it so that you don't get steep slopes that are more liable to eroding. And then to the right, the bottom end of a lot of arroyos, which I would call again that conveyance zone where the bulk of the water is being transported out uh, of this um, erosive landscape type. And it is here that you sometimes can do something, but it is very costly and you have to know exactly what you're doing to shore up the banks or to hold um, the sediment back because uh, the water comes through here with enormous amounts and enormous force. And what you see here as just the bottom of the arroyo may be suspended for several feet uh, in saturated uh, conditions. So that entire uh, boulders uh, start skidding uh, on the saturated dirt in these arroyos. So putting a dam in here may actually wash away within the first uh, rainstorm that comes down. And so work in these arroyos needs to be engineered very, very carefully because uh, they are much more, you could say, flowing and fluid than uh, you would imi uh, initially uh, think of. So uh, water is really on the move in this landscape. And uh, I wanna show here uh, what it does. Um, the bottom left picture shows actually how in tracks uh, water uh, follows the tracks and eventually erodes that. And then in the uh, center top picture, you can see how ruts from tires uh, or maybe even cattle walking there eventually leads to arroyo, to um, yeah, little arroyos to gullies. And then eventually they grow into bigger gullies and into huge uh, washes. And let's see what that does because that's a little video. And after many rainstorms, uh, significant rainstorms, this is what you can see after 20 minutes or so after the storm, the waterfront starts approaching. So you have to really live there to see this kind of um, flowing of the uh, arroyos. And I'm grateful for a local resident there, Chuck Wright, who uh, sent me this video from a storm last year. So what then does that water do? Well, it creates a lot of uh, impacts in the landscape. Uh, it creates turbid waters and turbid water is a huge pollution uh, source and pollution problem um, because it reduces uh, the livability of the water for uh, macroinvertebrates, for fish, and um, it is loaded with so much sediment, that water, that it will clog acequias, uh, create huge sandbanks 
in the in the river, and uh, it can congest uh, culverts, bridges, etc. And if big arroyos that actually are naturally forming the you could say evacuation and conveyance zones of water out of the landscape are getting clogged then water will start flowing over the highways and into people's backyards and then you really have a disaster and uh, that is uh, what uh, the highway department here working in the picture of the top right uh, really wants to prevent in Dixon and uh, there are many places in northern Mexico that have these challenges where enormous amounts of sediment are deposited on uh, private land and public areas and roads and in infrastructure like our secchias. Um, in 2014, I was part of a research team figuring out how much sediment actually comes down roughly. And in that year, we measured that just in this study area, uh, we got 14,000 uh, tons of sediment coming down. So that is 1,400 10-ton dump trucks uh, coming down. Uh, from those hillsides in, in one season, basically. And that was uh, the, the bigger part of all the sediment that basically came down that year in the entire 200,000 acre watershed. And the area that we're talking here about is only 10%, but delivering uh, around 70% of the entire sediment load into the Rio and Budo and the Rio Grande. So what is soil? We're talking a lot about that here. And um, for the purpose of this webinar, I've chosen a definition, because there are many, that is used by the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Services for the purpose of categorizing soil types. And it reads, soil is a natural body comprised of solids, minerals, and organic matter, liquid and gases that occurs in the lands, on the land surface, occupies space and is characterized by one or both of the following. Horizons or layers that are distinguishable from the initial material as a result of additions, losses, transfers, and transformations of energy and matter or the ability to support rooted plants in a natural environment. So let's look at that in detail, what that means. Soil is formed by uh, the forces and the components of the atmosphere, the biosphere, the hydrosphere, and the lithosphere. That means atmosphere provides gases and heat. The hydrosphere, of course, provides water. The biosphere, life in the form of plants, animals, microorganisms. And the lithosphere provides uh, minerals from the soil, from the earth, from rock, right? And then with the influences of time, topography, meaning also gravity, and people, uh, these elements, these products from these different uh, geophysical spheres interact. They're in that top layer of Earth um, and start a, a chemical, a biochemical process. And in that process, an, an entire new ecosystem is created that is termed the pedosphere or the soil environment. And that's really what soil is. It's that overlapping area of those four geophysical spheres. And not only the spheres, but everything that happens in them, the processes, the chemistry, uh, and the interactions between them. And it is as a result of those interactions that soil actually exists. It's not so much uh, a material, it's actually the emanation of the interactions, the, geophysical processes, the chemistry between those spheres that lead to soil. If any of those stop acting, stop changing, stop participating in the exchanges, uh, soil will eventually just wither. So what does soil consist of if we just take a snapshot? Well, it is, like I mentioned, a lot of inorganic mineral matter. Uh, and then some organic matter, including microorganisms and some macroorganisms. Um, the latter is between zero and 5%, leading the inorganic min mineral material to be anywhere between 
50 and and 45 percent. But if you don't have the organic matter, eventually you don't have much soil. So that is a critical component actually that makes that soil. And very important active ingredients are water and air, and they fluctuate a lot in their uh, presence in the soil and are making up roughly 50% together. But you may ask, how is soil then different from rock and dirt? Well, that's what I hinted at by saying that it is important to have at least this little bit of organic matter and that soil would be dead really and not there if there were only mineral material. And rock and dirt is that mineral material and soil is just the combination of everything and the interactions between everything as a complete ecosystem, the fact that it's alive. And with that, it has all the mutualistic, um, symbiotic and competitive uh, components and, and processes of organisms and ecosystems. Mutualistic meaning that um, basically they, they help each other and have an equal exchange or symbiotic that they live together and uh, need each other to live or competitive is that actually they um, meet and compete for the same resources and that there is a balance uh, needed. And if the balance is broken, eventually uh, the healthy soil that we are striving for is going to degrade. So balance is everything in this. Balance in the amounts of things, but also in the processes that hold it all in place. It is a very particular part of earth because rock and dirt are in many different uh, locations and in deeper down in, in earth, but uh, soil is only in the upper part of the mineral matrix of the earth's surface. Uh, really the only couple of feet or sometimes a couple of inches. Um, and it's really important to have a balanced proportional amount of living biomass versus no life meaning organic versus mineral material life, uh, material in, in the soil. And it is just that, those proportional amounts that eventually lead us to identify soil layers, which are also called soil horizons. And we can often distinguish them by their color and their texture. Let's look at that. Um, each soil is different because of the different uh, depths, textures, and colors of uh, these soil horizons. At the top, we have the O horizon, named after organic, uh, that's the organic zone of plant litter that is not decomposed yet or just beginning to decompose. Just below it, we have what is called the A horizon, which is the surface zone or the topsoil component um, with a lot of particulate organic matter that is gradually being decomposed by uh, animals, small macro and microorganisms that uh, break that down uh, and um, that in their own death uh, add to the organic matter component in that A horizon. And together, because of their high biological activity, they're called the upper soil. Then we go deeper and you can often see that very clearly in the soil, that there is a distinct difference between the A and B horizon. And you get into a zone where actually only roots are active and where all the organic uh, biochemistry is directly related to the root zone. And also the organic matter accumulation and carbon accumulation is directly in association with the root zone and the fungal uh, networks between the roots. Going deeper even, we get to the sea horizon, which is the parent material, rocks or decomposed uh, mineral matter uh, with a little bit of root material, and that's the C1 horizon. And if we get into the layer of the parent material without any organic or life component, then it's called the C2 horizon. And the B horizon and C horizon are the lower soil because they still have uh, a low levels of biological activity. And then the C2 and R horizon, which is the parent rock, have no soil, no organic matter, no biological life, and they're just the parent rock material. 
So then the question is, how does this soil hold water, right? Um, well, it is really important to think of soil not as a very dense material. It has actually a lot of openings, pores. And the pores retain water through two forces, capillary forces, which are called, which we know also as wicking, and osmotic forces, which is water adherence to molecules or ions. Together, these two forces are called the matrix suction or matrix suction. After soil has been saturated, even uh, either from water in this um, water table moving up or by rain or precipitation or flooding infiltrating, part of that water eventually drains out uh, under the influence of gravity or it evaporates. And uh, then those pores open up. The moment at which the force of gravity and evaporation is the same as the capillary and osmotic suction, the drainage will stop. Because at that point, that suction from um, the adherence to particles, uh, sand grains, for instance, or clay particles, is so strong that uh, these voids, for instance, that void with the word poor, uh, will be empty, but the darker blue areas um, have that suction that holds that water around uh, those grains. And that's called field capacity. That's the, the, the status of water availability in the soil. It's called field capacity. At that point, plants can still suck the water from the pores up to the point where the maximum suction of the suction power of the plant is reached. And at that point, after that, plants will just wilt if uh, photosynthesis tries to pull more water out of the plant because they cannot replenish that water by sucking it up from the surface of those sand grains. And therefore, that particular point is called the wilting point. So there are various stages of water availability in the soil. That is, when it is saturated, or when it's gradually draining out of those pores, when it's at the field capacity and that plants can still take up some, uh, up to the point that they cannot overcome that suction capacity, uh, capillary and, and molecular level uh, suction on the, on the particles, and then the plants will wilt. So that is important to understand because uh, that leads us to various observations. If uh, sand particles, or think even about gravel, uh, are main, the main component of a soil type, then you have very large pores, and the surface of those particles is relatively small. So the water holding capacity of those uh, soil types is very low. Clay particles, or loam, which is uh, having a silt component slightly bigger than clay particles, hold actually relatively much more water. They also have a higher adherence uh, to the particles, but the plants have a greater chance to actually suck water off the surfaces of those particles. So the water holding capacity um, after uh, the water has drained in clay and loam is a lot higher, and therefore they're actually uh, having more available water for plants. But it also means that sedimentary soils that have a lot of sand and gravel have difficulty um, holding uh, a lot of water and providing a growing medium for plants. So, then the question is, how can we improve soil structure if, in sedimentary soils particularly, um, we cannot hold so much water? Well, you might think, just add water. No, not yet. And for those who've seen the presentation, this joke is old, but I want to repeat it for those who haven't seen it. Um, most important is to add organic matter and life forms. And why? Because organic matter and life forms help us create a diversity of pore sizes and direction of pores. So if the size and three-dimensional structure of the soil is improved, 
by adding organic matter, you get better mixing of the pores and water in the soil and uh, over time, a more distinct development of the soil horizons, which is really important for developing rooting capacity for plants. And that uh, creates space for life forms and biological activity, those biochemistry activities that I talked about earlier, and which lead to the process called humification, the forming of humus, the very fine, stable uh, carbon compounds in the soil that are so important for defining what soil is, but also creating the environment in which plants can grow and water can be retained. And in that process of humification and plant life and biological activity in the soil, uh, ion exudates are uh, created mostly by fungi, but also by um, other small uh, soil microbes. And uh, they are very important as minerals, uh, mineral food for the plants. And ions, again, as we heard, uh, help in holding water. And so therefore you get in all these different uh, things that are created in soil, uh, optimal retention of water and optimal uh, structure of pores and uh, mineral and biological soil environment that can hold that water. So let's summarize it here again then. Um, soil health is then the balance and interaction of the biosphere uh, with its plant and animal litter products that then are being decomposed, the water from the hydrosphere that helps with mineral transport and chemical reactions, the gases and heat from the atmosphere that help with the gas and heat exchanges and the chemical processes in the soil, the minerals from the lithosphere that help with mineral weathering, and help with the ions that are necessary for all life in, in the soil. And that leads then to stable organic compounds in the soil in that pedosphere and the biochemical conversion that's an ongoing process between all the elements uh, and components that are mentioned in the top, top part of this, uh, this table. And people who have paid attention may see that actually I updated this table. I looked at it again last time and felt like, huh, this is not quite right. And so um, as we move forward, uh, think about this table as maybe a better version than what I presented at the, at the first webinar. Now, how does soil health degrade? Now that we know what uh, it takes, um, there are a lot of processes, natural ones and human-induced ones, that uh, tug at the health of soil. They're often called stresses. Um, and what are the stresses on the soil that lead to unhealthy soil conditions? First of all, we have, of course, an entire category of natural stressors, like drought, fire, flooding, and slope and geology-driven erosion, just the tugging of gravity. And eventually, when, for instance, a rock is cracked as a result of uh, frost heave, then eventually geology or the, the, the gravity will pull that down. The second piece is uh, the legacy stressors from grazing, tree removal, dry land farming, water extraction. And there are some example pictures here in the center what the result of that looks like. And then the, the, at the bottom two, we look at the current stressors. Uh, caused by clearing, for instance, clearing for say, a ball field or a parking lot, um, clearing for home development or an industrial complex. And then all-terrain vehicles, off-road vehicles, trucks, motorcycles, etc., which are forming an increasing problem of our wildlands and rangelands, including wetlands, forests, uh, in terms of a disturbance that actually cuts deep into our soils. And we're going to look in depth at those kind of effects uh, during this webinar. And then there's farming, especially farming that doesn't uh, prevent soil degradation, that doesn't follow 
soil health principles, which we're going to discuss as well, and things like construction and roads. Well, I'm trying to advance, and there we go. So the causes of loss of soil health and the loss of soil itself, um, they can be worked out in more detail here. And the natural causes, I'll list them very quickly, and then we're going to look at them, are typically those of weather and climate. For instance, heavy rainfall, which uh, unleashes energy that uh, that energy of raindrops causes a lot of disturbance on the soil. We're going to talk about that. Then the flash floods uh, that flow over the land and eventually end up in arroyos. But the arroyos themselves, uh, when there is a flash flood, have a problem with bank erosion and undermining. And at some points when the, flash, the, the arroyos are blocked because of a, uh, a tree that has fallen in or a sediment bank, then these flash floods will flow over the banks and start ripping up uh, healthy soils on the floodplain or beyond it. And then, of course, heat and drought have major impacts on soil. Uh, think about, the, again, heat and drought impacts on the organic and living components of the soil particularly. Then there, are, of course, are soils that are sensitive and rock layers that are exposed and that are easily falling apart. Maybe they're perched, maybe they're high up and not supported very well. Um, other natural causes have to do with slope, the length of the slope and the steepness of the slope. The longer and steeper slopes, uh, the more gravity pulls at it and uh, in combination with other forces then may undermine and carry away uh, topsoil. And then there are concentrated events. I mentioned flooding, but think of wildfires, um, insect pests, massive plant die off uh, from heat that then eventually leads to cumulative effects on the land. Then there is excessive animal pressure, uh, grazing, browse, hoof action, et cetera, just damage to the topsoil that eventually carves into it and exposes lower layers that are more uh, sensitive. Heavy access by people in terms of treading, trampling, and wheel pressure. The clearing that I mentioned, plant removal, scraping of mineral and organic litter, topsoil, removing of stones. Construction and cultivation, the removal of and turning of mineral and organic cover, and um, just the removal of soil in, in general that happens in some of those activities. And then contamination. Um, Pollution actually reduces soil life, as you may uh, surmise, uh, because the soil gets either covered or uh, contaminated with um, leachates that are chemical and toxic, um, or these piles of pollution may concentrate water flows around them that concentrate that water and then carve out specific areas, and that eventually then lead to plant die-off and soil removal. So now before we're going to look at some of those factors, I'll take you on a wild ride. All right. Well, I hope you're still in your chair. Uh, this is, uh, of course, done with a drone, but it gives an idea of what some people feel 
about uh, when you're uh, on the land in an off-road vehicle and carve all those trails. And uh, it is uh, often, uh, for some people, I suppose, giving them a thrill, and, but it leads to a lot of disturbance, as you can see. And uh, from the top of the ridges all the way down, and in an area like this, probably 50% or so of the terrain has been impacted by those off-road vehicles. And that is definitely an example of, uh, of disturbances that we're seeing around Dixon, but in many other places in northern New Mexico and up and down uh, the western United States. And it leads to significant um, soil disturbance, soil health, degradation, erosion, and eventually collapse of entire uh, woodland ecosystems that uh, under the imp influence of other uh, forces that I already mentioned cannot sustain these kind of uses. So what are then the signs of soil health degradation? Lack of cover, like we've seen it, and especially the connected patches of bare ground. And why is the connected, connectedness of these patches so critical? Well, once you have connected patches, water starts to flow all over the place and you start uh, getting uh, the effect of uh, the scour of water in many unforeseen places. And the soil is being turned over and churned by that water and the sediment that it carries in all the different uh, places and it undermines plant growth or it covers it up in, in other locations. So like I said, soil disturbance, soil gets turned over, moved, eroded, contaminated. Uh, a third sign is the loss of soil life and soil biodiversity, because you can imagine that if we have enormous pressures on the soil, like from tires, and then water flows over it, that entire parts of topsoil wash away and with that, uh, all the soil life that is in the top several inches of the soil. And after that, the incorporation and breakdown of organic matter that was there of little twigs and stems and uh, grasses that were bent over uh, gets poorer and poorer. And uh, with that also, uh, you'd basically undermine the possibilities for desirable plants, animals, fungi, uh, moss and lichens and microbial life forms to uh, to be in those places, let alone to for it to to function properly and to develop. And then you get that roots are becoming exposed and that roots are dying. Uh, roots become shorter, smaller, uh, and eventually just uh, plants die altogether. And in those areas, there's nothing for animals to eat to shelter in. So animal presence will gradually disappear. Uh, so also their excrement will not um, improve the soil. Their hoof action will not help uh, create little divots in which organic matter or seeds can stay and uh, soil degrades tremendously. And here are some signs of that. And water being moved away uh, loosened or soil being loosened and then moved away, for instance, by water um, leads to erosion. And this is what happens. Damage to plants and soils like roots being exposed, um, exposure of soils to the elements so that actually the topsoil starts cracking, plants can no longer grow, there is no water that holds it. Parts of particles are loosened by different forces like tires. Um, Gravity pulls at it and pulls entire rock masses away with the topsoil on top of it. Then that dirt, that soil, is transported out by water. Transportation by wind is very important too, especially uh, the silt and clay particles are easily lifted by wind and form a form of erosion that is about three times more important in terms of the, its weight of uh, soil removal in New Mexico and pasture land than even water erosion uh, in the order of 15 to 16 tons per acre per year on an average New Mexico pasture. 
according to the NRCS. Uh, then there is, of course, mechanical transportation. When roads are built or roads are graded or terrain is being modified for human use. So that leads us then to what are the signs of erosion and soil loss, right? What is erosion? I mentioned it. The loosening and removal of soil components. And I just boiled it down to that very simple definition. There are much longer definitions. So the loosening and removal of soil components, including the organic and mineral litter, the topsoil, mineral particles, and deeper organic matter. And then soil loss, which is often uh, used almost synonymously with uh, erosion, is in fact the result of the erosion. It's the disappearance of the soil. And how do you know? What are those signs? Well, we saw some of them. The most important ones are that there are bare dirt patches, and again, connected patches of dirt, bare dirt, that there is plant pedestalling, desert pavement, which are uh, which is a gravel cover of, uh, in which all the fine particles have been removed. So there are very few fine particles left because the fine particles have been removed by wind. And uh, this kind of desert, desert pavement has very few plants. We'll see an enlarged microtopography more up and down in the, in the landscape, mass soil removal uh, in swales, rills, and gullies, also called arroyos. And we see sediment patches, mounds and fans of sediment. So and this is what it looks like. Here are the erosion features. Again, an example of the crusting. Crusting often happens not only by drying, but by raindrop splash. If a raindrop falls on the dirt, on the topsoil, and it's exposed, you get that the fine particles, of course, under the influence of the energy of that raindrop are lifted up much higher, right? So in the splash that happens, you get that the, the coarser particles stay more on the surface, they're moved just gently, but the finer particles are removed. So you get gradually a sorting of the fine particles on top of the coarse particles. And once they start drying up, they start to crack. And then also when water and wind get hold of those finer particles at the top, they start to blow or wash off. And that's actually where the erosion really begins, but, or where, where, uh, where you can see it begin. Because the raindrop splash, we often don't see it, but that's actually where erosion really begins. So, and then uh, the erosion called by, caused by wind leads then to what I mentioned is the desert pavement. You see that in the center top image where you have a lot of gravels, very few plants, because all the silt and, and fine sand and clay is removed by the wind. Top uh, bottom left, you see also an uh, example of crusting. It is a crusting that's not cracked yet. And another example that happens in these situations is that you get then that water flows over it and removes uh, parts of the defined particles so that the plants then basically getting, are getting stooled, you could say, pedestaled, and that they're elevated sometimes a couple of inches, sometimes all the way uh, with their roots exposed. And that's called pedestaling. And when you have bio, uh, bio crusts, uh, they are holding on to that dirt like we saw in the first webinar. Uh, much better than just bare soil. And uh, so those biocrusts start to stick up too. And you see that here in the bottom left picture also. All the darker uh, colored areas are biocrusts and their shade of the pedestal. And all the areas around it have been uh, washed out. That's called sheet erosion. In the bottom center picture, you see that with grass that's been undermined, that's blue grammar grass. And because the, of the connectedness of the bare dirt, like I mentioned earlier, you get that that washing, that sheet washing, uh, gets um, enhanced, you could say, and that eventually those areas uh, become very difficult for plants to keep a foothold in because their entire surroundings, once they become pedestal, are drying out because they're drying out also from the sides now. 
and their roots get exposed, and then eventually those plants will die. And here's a sign of that. And you see actually how the edges of this clump of glucrama are drying out more rapidly. So they are dying and drying, and that turns that grass white, gray, um, as you can see. And then the final example is the sediment blanketing, uh, where actually you see that sediment is accumulating uh, around little um, things that stick out of the landscape and where, where the sediment settles down eventually and where plants sometimes are entirely covered. Uh, and that also leads to, to problems. The sediment by itself is a sign that we've had erosion somewhere else. And the fact that the sediment is covering all the plants uh, prohibits the, the plant regeneration in those areas. More severe features of erosion are then rill erosion, which is uh, where slope, uh, the slopes get steeper and water gets more concentrated. It flows down and in more concentrated uh, energy um, pulses takes away larger amounts of soil and and dirt. And so that then leads to those kind of furrows. And the definition of a rill is that you actually uh, can mechanically uh, remove it by using a shovel or a plow and that you can kind of cover it up. Um, but once a rill cannot easily be covered up anymore because it comes to, becomes too deep, uh, for instance, if it's bigger than uh, a foot deep and a foot wide, it turns pretty much in what is called a gully. And the top right, you see a gully, although this has been rehabilitated, but this gully I stood in it was as tall as I am, which is five foot six or five foot seven. I could barely look over the edge when it was um, not filled in yet. And we uh, used pickets with wicker to actually capture the sediment and fill this back in for three or four feet. And now this gully, although it's still um, a gully, it's much more controlled and it's maybe only a foot and a half deep, but at least gives a good idea of the concentrated flows that happen in gullies. These gullies um, can get really big and then even eventually start to undermine their banks, like I said. So they're not only uh, digging down, but they're also getting wider. And that's what you see here in the Arroyo uh, Mina, La Mina in, in Dixon, a notoriously uh, big and fast flowing Arroyo on the west side of the village. Um, bottom left is another sign of erosion features, but it has to do with the sedimentation, an alluvial floodplain. So where an arroyo area hits um, a flatter part of the landscape or where there are a lot of obstacles like trees, um, the flow starts to braid and, and to slow down. And with that slowing of the energy of the flow, sediments start to drop out from the small particles of clay and, and silt all the way to the coarser particles of, of boulders. And you see that here. Uh, the very fine particles are here on the floodplain banks uh, in the bottom right of the picture. The coarser sand, gravel, and boulders are in the center of this arroyo here. Another sign of erosion is uh, issues of compaction and scour. Here again, uh, an area that has been impacted by off-road vehicles and where the tracks um, and just the, the, the vehicle tire movement uh, combined with gravity uh, destroy the top and then basically kick dirt and gravel and rock down that slope. And this is a steep slope. We're looking at probably 30, 40 percent uh, looking uphill. Um, and eventually water will do the trick by scouring in those ruts and turning this into gullies. And finally, at the bottom of uh, these drainages, these uh, conveyance zones, as I'm, these funnel uh, spouts, as I called them earlier, you have alluvial fans with sometimes tracks in them combined. You have a lot of combination of issues uh, that can happen um, as uh, a combined set of features of erosion. So now we're coming to a point here where I would like to um, do a little exercise. And I would like you to uh, write down for yourself what erosion, erosion features you can see here. And 
um, we're going to go over this and then uh, we, you can send me some in, more information maybe by chat. So the first one that you can see is compaction and scour, right? That looks like this. Then lower down where water really gets concentrated, the compaction and scour leads to rill erosion and rutting. Part of that scour is higher up, is already a rill in fact, and there are ruts as well. But there are two different uh, components of that rill erosion and rutting. And then you get a bunch of crusting, right? The raindrop splash and the pedestalling and the sheet erosion that I mentioned. And then, again, this is a, a pedestaled area with a large bare surface that covers the sheet erosion or that it accommodates that sheet erosion or ca causes the sheet erosion across this entire uh, hillside. And looking at this hill, I would say that more than 50% is bare, right? Now, so how can we keep our soils healthy? That leads us to the five soil health principles. Healthy soils defined as soil that enhances its continuing capacity to function as a biological system, increases its organic matter, and improves its structure and water and nutrient holding capacity. Really all those elements that I mentioned earlier in that graph and the table that um, have to do with the balance between all those different spheres, right? So, and then to keep soils healthy, um, scientists at the state and, and nationwide have identified five soil health principles. And implementing each principle and even better, all five principles together, helps us keep the soils healthy in any given environment, whether it's here on these uplands or on a farm environment. So in using these uh, principles guarantees that the soil maintains its optimal structure, remains resilient and it's with its self-healing capacity, and that it sustains its biological functions. And that's key of those five soil health principles. And let's look at them. So for first is keeping soil covered. I went over it kind of rapidly in the first webinar. I'm going to address it in more depth now. Uh, soil cover relates to the presence of living plants and uh, of organic and mineral mulches, such as plant litter, woody debris, and stone material. So how do you think these cover materials keep the soil healthy? Well, think for instance, of it as a protective skin. Think of it uh, in the terms of the exchange and cycling of uh, materials uh, that lead to the biological activities in the soil. And think, of course, of water retention, but also of the protection of the soil against splash erosion that I mentioned earlier. And think of it eventually as the broken down organic matter that is a growing medium or a habitat for plants and animals and our interactions with the soil. The second is to minimize soil disturbance. And that relates to activities that impact the soil above ground, such as turning of soil, compaction by hooves and wheels, removal or uh, deposition of soil, and cover or spillage of trash, oil, chemicals, and construction materials, and so on. And all those things, of course, inhibit natural soil functions. The second component, uh, mostly important on uh, fields, on crop fields, are to minimize external inputs. And I will expand on that in uh, future webinars. Um, but it has to do, of course, with fertilizers, fungicides, herbicides, pesticides, etc., cetera, or um, engineered uh, components that hold soil together. And for instance, in this kind of a landscape, we can do that with uh, uh, spray on uh, materials that are on the market as highly engineered erosion control. But often they're not cost effective and 
they are bringing in chemicals that uh, biodegrade very slowly and may actually not be very helpful in this landscape. Now, how do you think the minimization of such disturbances and external inputs keeps the soil healthy? Well, think of the natural and biological processes that form the structure of the soil and uh, direct ecological soil functions and the support that it gives to many organisms in the soil. Think of the natural symbiotic processes in the soil that really uh, happen on their own power and within that balance of those four elements and that actually don't need much of our help by external inputs than just creating the environment in which they can thrive and take place. Then the fourth, third principle is the maximization of biodiversity, which relates to the multitude of diverse life forms above ground and that interact with and depend on soil for their survival, rejuvenation, and resilience in their interdependent relationships. And this includes all life forms from fungi to plants to animals, including genetic richness, that these elements represent. And how do you think that maximum biodiversity keeps the soil healthy? Well, think of the many life forms in the soil and how they play a role in the digestion and cycling of products from life forms above ground and how some above ground life forms have life cycles in the soil and depend on soil organisms for food. Then there is maintaining, maintaining a living root. Living roots relate to the perennial and annual plants that photosynthesize above ground and contribute to the carbon exchanges in the soil. And how do they support soil health? Well, think of how living roots of plants play a role in water and mineral exchanges with soil organisms, or of the symbi symbiosis of soil organisms in the cycles and webs of life between atmosphere, water flows, mineral soil, and life above and below ground. And then finally, the role of animals, uh, be it livestock, wildlife, small soil organisms, all relate to soil health in their natural interactions with the soil. You might think of excrement, break, excrement breakdown, um, the breakdown of plant matter and a role in incorporating the litter into the soil under the influence of hooves or animals that dig or nest and that help with mixing the organic matter and aerate the soil. So how do we use the five soil health principles? We use it in monitoring, uh, which uh, is largely observation and analysis, uh, with, for instance, simple soil testing methods. We've done that in the first webinar. And the bullseye method that I uh, like to use, um, and that I discussed also in the first webinar. And then, of course, in soil uh, and land management practices. Given the time, I wanna skip clarifying questions right now. I see that the clock has been ticking while I've been talking. And so I need to move on so that we have time maybe for uh, questions at the end. And so I am going through this exercise of soil healing that I wanted to do. But here in this picture, we see the context of this picture, uh, close up picture that I showed you earlier. So, in looking at the um, bullseye method, it is important to uh, identify the key elements above ground that help us uh, think about what's happening underground. So, of course, bare ground is one of the key elements. And in the bullseye method, we look at the amount and size of bare areas, uh, whether they nearly or totally match that expected or desired for the site. And if so, that would be achieving gold regarding bare ground. If not, um, if there's something missing, if, the, for instance, the uh, bare ground areas are somewhat connected, then we're looking more at, um, at a silver area. Um, or silver qualification. If there are uh, large amounts of bare areas, much bigger and larger than expected or desired, then we're in the bronze. And so on, you can do that with 
erosion, plant pedestalling, litter amount, litter distribution, litter incorporation, dung breakdown and incorporation. So note this picture and um, figure out for yourself for a moment where we're at here, right? What are the scoring elements that you would observe in a landscape like this? It will be hard to look, of course, at dung breakdown and incorporation because you cannot really see that. But things like erosion, maybe even plant pedestalling and litter amount, and even litter distribution, you can see. And I'll show my scoring in, uh, in a couple of minutes. So the second part of the scoring guide looks at percent desirable plants and whether it's greater than 66% um, or between 33 and 66%, which then would be silver or below 33%, which is then in the bronze. So meaning uh, less desirable uh, in terms of the qualification, not a, about the percent desirable plants, but less, a less desirable condition of uh, having desirable plants. Age class distribution. Well, that's a little hard in this image, but that's something to look at uh, if you can in the field. Plant species diversity and functionality. Uh, do, do the plants cover the soil? Do they help in um, with pollinator functions? Do they provide multiple habitats? Do they uh, root deeply or not? Do they provide shelter functions for other plants, etc. The amount of living organisms, is it abundant or not? Plant canopy, which is somewhat related to bare dirt, but uh, in itself is important to note. Plant vigor and color. If there's a lot of white or yellowish or otherwise dead plants, you'll see that easily uh, through color. And then plant distribution, right? Is it uniformly distributed across the soil? or not so, is it becoming fragmented like in this picture or very fragmented really like in the bottom part of the picture? Well, I scored it like this. In terms of bare ground, you may recall it was pretty bad, right? A lot of bare ground, it was in the low bronze. In terms of erosion, there's a lot of erosion going on. Uh, not all of it was eroded, it was some sheet erosion and beginning areas were beginning to crack, but it was still in the bronze uh, as I uh, ranked it based on the scoring guide. Plant pedestalling was happening to some extent. Uh, it was definitely not good, but it was not extremely bad. So that was in a low silver. Litter amount, well, did you see any litter? It was very little, right? So that was in a low bronze. Litter distribution, the same. Litter incorporation, really on that site, I couldn't see much of it, there was some dung uh, or excrement, mostly from uh, rabbits. It was really on top of the soil. There was very little breakdown and incorporation. Most of the plants were desirable, although some were somewhat weedy. So it was kind of in the middle silver, but it, and it could definitely be better. And it was not much. Age classes, well, most were really mature or very young. Plant species diversity and functionality, it was really poorly functional. Living organisms were very few. Plant canopy, there was hardly anything except in some patches. The vigor of what was there was reasonably okay. Plant distribution was extremely patchy. So it was not a very good site, right? Well, that's what you get if you have a site that is already very sensitive and then degraded by off-road off vehicle use. So then using the five principles, I listed what we found here. So the principles and objectives that I identified were, for instance, uh, removing the degrading causes, the stressors, uh, the so the, removing the sources of disturbance is really the first thing you need to do. And uh, that actually helps then with um, keeping uh, the entire soil together and maintaining biodiversity. Um, 
negotiating what, what is a solution, for instance, or a practice is negotiating alternative locations for those off-road vehicles and preventing further access. Improving the soil structure, adding organic matter and microbes, and slowing down the pool of gravity is really critical. And therefore, we need to stabilize the soil and texture and topography and mix in organic matter, maybe inoculate it uh, with mycorrhizae if we can. Removing the degrading causes to stressors by improving water flows and stabilizing the soil, because the degrading cause is not only the off-road vehicles, it's also uh, related to water flows. And so spreading that water and sinking it in the soil by constructing small earth structures, rock structures, is critical. Covering the soil, again, uh, the first principle, maximum soil cover. Sheltering the soil from treading water, wind, and sun is critical. For instance, by spreading mulch and stones. Supporting and using existing plants. Using existing vegetation as anchors. Um, and then eventually mulching it and uh, supporting that they, these plants get the water that now rushes by them. Planting and seeding and ensuring increased biodiversity and living root development, right? Um, that's, that can be done by uh, planting and seeding. Introducing animal action, for instance, by providing habitat with the existing and new vegetation, but also maybe bringing in worms or uh, planting pollinator plants, um, et cetera. And then and an important one that relates to all soil health principles is observing, learning, and improving by annual monitoring, for instance, with the bullseye method and adaptive management. Okay, let's see if I can forward this. All right, I need to go through this quickly. But removing causes uh, and changing the land use is really critical. Um, in our exercise, this off-road vehicle use was the single largest disturbance, which is in fact a land use cause, right? And uh, land use stressors uh, or the removal of them, which is resting the land, can lead to natural land healing. There are 118 drainages in the lower Embudo Valley, and many you can see here on this map. And 105 of those drainages are smaller than 247 acres or a square kilometer and they represent 8% of the total watershed. Small drainages have a very flashy storm character. They call, cause basically rapid flows uh, that we also know as flash floods. And those concentrated flows cause bank erosion, like I mentioned before, and immediate sedimentation downstream. So they wreak havoc immediately on the road and in the village and on the acequias. So small drainages have a proportionally large effect on the entire watershed. So if we have a small drainage like this off-road vehicle area that we were showing, then healing such a small drainage shows immediate effect and the intense use uh, that, that is caused uh, on the bare ground by, for instance, off-road vehicles should not take place in such small uh, drainages because they are causing a disproportionate downstream effect. Right? So finding larger drainages that have more internal buffer capacity is important. So soil healing and soil structure and cover leads then to the following options. So we can rest, do have Mother Nature do its work. We can do cover cropping or crimping, not appropriate actually in this area, but on, uh, maybe on fields. We can do mulching and composting or imprinting, inoculum, application, key line plowing, also not appropriate here, but we'll show that in next webinars. Hardware mulching and seeding, terracing uh, structurally or with just natural materials like logs on contour, plant litter contours, rows of stones, contour planting, or off contour terracing as above and in key line design. So I wanna just touch briefly on uh, key line plowing and compaction treatment, because that is so important in these compacted uh, off-road vehicle areas. Although we cannot do key lining here, we can do similar techniques. And at least it gives an idea of how we can actually, by applying plants 
or mulches get more water into the ground. At the bottom, you see here a natural mulch, and I tried to stick my uh, soil knife in there, and it didn't even go in an inch. In a shredded wood chip mulch that was applied several months before, and the wood chip mulch is only one or two inches thick, it immediately improved uh, the compaction situation, and I could stick in my knife more than six inches, so four inches at least, or five, into the, into the soft soil that was softened as a result by the wood chip mulch. Other soil healing techniques are rock lines on contour, slash terracing, straw bales on terraces, and log terracing, or contour wattling, like in the bottom left diagram. And it's important to also anticipate water flows and soil stability by placing earth berms, berms and swales, thicket dams, plug and spreads where you put a little plug in an arroyo and make that water flow over the floodplain and spread it out. And uh, that has been very effective in spreading the water across the landscape and watering areas that had been deprived because the water stayed in the arroyo. Other soil cover methods are lop and scatter, shredded wood chips, um, plant mulch and composts, rock mulches, slash and natural regeneration, and a combination of techniques, of course, and cover crops. Then working with existing plants, you can do that by using existing plants as anchors for the techniques I've shown keying in into grass and forbs for a rock structure, uh, using the plants as micro topography around the structures to guide water, using trimmings of trees so you don't have to thin the area if you don't want to do that, at least trim the lower skirt down, especially on the north side, um, so that grass can grow there and snow will benefit on that north end, and use those trimmings as soil cover in the open areas. Use existing wetlands, like I mentioned earlier, as plugs for upper valleys. And using pickets of some cut uh, juniper, for instance, like here buried, and that accumulate in the wetlands an enormous amount of sediment water and stimulate plant growth. Planting and seeding is important. And in our climate and areas, wider than deeper is, uh, rather than deep, is important in tree planting so that the topsoil needs to be loosened for water infiltration and collection around the planted tree and then creating a tree well. If you can, amend the soil, that would be great, uh, at least with some compost in the bottom, and then protecting it with stakes against wind or collars against uh, deer and mulching the planting area. Then introducing animals. So you see I go through the five principles. Habitat and forage um, for birds and small mammals is created that way. Adding earthworms in small areas could be useful. And even if you do it in a um, several square feet on a rehab area, like I mentioned earlier, that already will eventually uh, spread through the entire area. And then once the area is rehabilitated, bringing in livestock may be an option. But there are many other practices like using rock in the form of one rock dams for great controls, like here at the bottom or at the left, or as a zuni bowl or a rock bowl to actually create a plunge pool uh, in drainages to basically scale a steep part of the drainage. And you can combine it then with a one rock dam at the bottom end to prevent undermining of the, of the zuni bowl. Or media lunas, which are rock strips in a half moon shape that spread the water. Uh, it's curved with the tips up slope so that if water uh, crosses it and as it crosses it perpendicularly, it spreads out. Rock rundowns, like in the pictures to the right, that actually guide that water in a secure way without erosion to a lower area, either an arroyo, a pond, or wherever, wherever you want it to go. And then you need to have a plan for implementation. That means, in the case, for instance, of these off-road vehicles, we need to include all the stakeholders and negotiate an agreement, 
about a conceptual plan and include their wishes. And we need to talk about who's going to do the work and will maintain it. What restoration techniques will be used? What's feasible and desirable and technically sound? When it will be done? What year? What season? What permits we might need or agreements? What equipment is going to be used and by whom? And what the work order is that uh, gets it done most efficiently? What supplies would we need? And who will bring those supplies? What resources are available locally or need to be bought or obtained? And what is plan B in case we cannot do it, right? Now with the COVID situation, a lot of projects have run into that. And what the indicators of success will be so that we can monitor it effectively. Well, going back to this image, you wonder what might I do, right? We're out of time, because I, but I will show it to you. I am going to think about placing rock structures, rock lines at the top to stop the rapid runoff here at the bare top. Capture water and sediment, and from there, gradually hold that water back at the top of this hill. Also then prevent off-road uh, vehicles to really reach the top because it may not be so pleasant to go over these boulders. Then interrupt the top of the tracks by having little berms and swales there. And I couldn't find a proper picture, so I did it this way. And media lunas, those blue ones, to spread the water on the side slopes. Then have straw bale um, little berms that block the water and spread it out from the tracks, if it even comes down in the tracks. Plant trees behind it, because we will get some water uh, behind those straw bales in the soft dirt. And have rock bowls, zuni bowls at the bottom for any excess water that still flows down so that a big gully washer doesn't undermine those straw bales and plantings. Then I'm going to spread juniper branches as mulch all over the place so that it's covered. You create a microclimate under which you can then have grasses grow back. Maybe you want to seed it before that. Uh, or put some worms in there. And with that, typically there's enough uh, native seed that actually uh, regeneration will take place. And this is one of the strategies that we hope to apply watershed-wide. There is a watershed plan for the entire Lower Embudo watershed. And in the map to the right, you see all the priority areas. And they cover uh, largely the priority erosion areas. We did an erosion mapping project, and the map to the bottom left shows in red and in orange the high erosion areas. So the drainages where that erosion takes place are the priority areas. And then we uh, talked with residents and local constituents to see whether there are lower watersheds where we should work to, and they're included as well. Fortunately, the agencies, the BLM, the state, and the Forest Service are very interested in helping, and they have their own plans for this landscape. And uh, so there is now a multitude of plans that open up the doors for federal and state funding to start working and applying these kinds of land rehabilitation and erosion control techniques throughout this landscape. So then the final question I want to leave you with, this is what you can do. Well, consider land use activities that impact uh, the soil in your area. Try to buffer those impacts, change the activities, or doing them elsewhere. Capture the water flows, spread them, and help them infiltrate. Like I tried to show in this demo uh, a couple of slides before. Shelter the soil from wind and immediate sunlight. Maintain and expand soil cover with stones, mulch, plant litter, and plants. Maintain and expand vegetation buffers on your fields, around your home, wherever you can maintain existing vegetation. Use native plants that are attractive to wild animals so that you attract animals into that landscape to do their job in help healing the land. Observe, monitor, learn, and creatively change what needs to be improved. Share those lessons with each other, collaborate. That leaves us maybe, we're over time though, with uh, some time for Q&A, and I leave it up to Adrian and Leah to see if we can do that.
And um, otherwise, we can maybe communicate by email. So Adrian and Leah, what do you think? Can we entertain some questions? And I'm sorry for running a little over. Yeah, let's entertain some questions. Let's do 10 minutes. Leah had to jump off, but I'll be here for all your queries. Uh, you can either wait until I finish asking the ones that people typed in, um, and I'll tell you when that is if you want to activate your mic at that time, or you can type in the box, and I'm happy to pose those to Jan Willem. So Jan Willem, let's see. The first question was just a real quick, uh, which book was the focus area that Again, at the beginning, that table with the different levels of the land, was that Juan Esteban Arellano's book, uh, and which one? Okay, so that cross-section, I mean, uh, yes. that's probably what you mean, right? Now, I yes. got that cross-section from Arnie Valdez, who mm -hmm. wrote uh, a publication, um, oh, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, and included the that, that in... Um, the county, Santa Fe County's uh, plan uh, in the chapter about uh, indigenous land uses. And so I think people should be able to find it still in the sustainable land development plan for Santa Fe County. And I need to dig to find uh, Arnie's an, a, original publication. Um, some of the terminology I ran by um, Esteban five, six years ago before he passed away. And he totally supported that and recognized that as a uh, typical uh, language for those type, type of landscapes. But the original source is Arnie Valdez. Great. The next question I'll just answer um, was from Camilio Edward Calabasa. And uh, he was asking about the PowerPoint. If you registered before the last 24 hours, you should have received an email with the materials and with the PowerPoint slides. And if you register between now and then, don't worry, we're going to send you an email out soon here, also with the survey, which helps let us know uh, and Jan Vilm know how this was impactful and what could be improved. And so uh, please be sure to fill that out. Uh, Annie Beal asked, can you talk about minimizing soil disturbance and the contrast with animal impact? Ah, I like that question. So, um, soils are resilient to up to a certain extent. And if we concentrate um, animal impacts, uh, well, animals have basically two major impacts that are detrimental to soil. That is hoof action and their um, biting of the, the vegetation. And so, and then the third one is that if that is being done uh, repetitively throughout a long period of time or um, repeated every same season every year, so if you get just one year that, for instance, uh, elk or cattle uh, graze very heavily and turn over the soil with their hooves, you may see that the soil is disturbed. However, if that soil was resilient and had not been impacted by other um, stressors before that, typically that soil and the vegetation rehabilitate itself over a period of years after that. However, if you would keep those animals there, or if you would come back a year later and do the same, then gradually the vegetation and the soil will lose their resilience uh, because they over time will more and more lose the biological activity, the organic matter and the structure in the top soil that is necessary for that soil to build itself back and for plants to regenerate there and to help in that uh, process that happens underground. So the problem is, is kind of complex because it has to do with what the starting conditions of the soil are to begin with, and then how intense the impact is of the animals. And we're, I, I interpreted your question here just um, with ungulates, grazing animals. Um, and then what happens after that? 
whether the, the intensity of the animal presence is continued and it's perpetuated at the same period of the year. And that is important because if you start raising or having the same impact, say all the time in May, June, or in September, uh, those animals will graze what is most uh, palatable for them right there. And they will over time deplete the plants and um, they will do the damage or whatever the impact they have compounded with the, the weather, the, 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 the animal activity of say birds um, that also are important in that season. And if those other elements either uh, make the impact of the animals worse or cannot compensate them enough, then you get that the animal impact on the land over time starts to deplete the soil and the land. I hope that, it, that that is clear. And if you have other animals in mind, then it depends completely on the animal activity that we need to talk about. It's a complex matter. Sorry, I cannot be clear, but that is uh, maybe a long answer to your question. Great, thank you. Uh, and I have about one or two more. I'm curious about Jan Willem's personal experiences incorporating earthworms into sites he has worked on. Can you talk to that, Jan Willem? I've only um, had one or two experiences a long time ago with uh, bringing in earthworms as um, kind of an experimental uh, activity. And I think that was part when I was director of the Earthworks Institute like, oh, 15 years ago or more. And I don't remember well enough um, what our experience was, whether they expanded uh, or not, how they did. Uh, just from growing earthworms at home, I've seen how quickly they expand and, and, and grow and uh, how you can grow them. So that, that is a, a fun thing to see and then uh, put them out in the yard, which we did. Uh, but I have not systematically monitored enough to see the effect. Uh, however, from the literature that you can find in general, uh, we know that the role of earthworms in temperate climates and even in our somewhat semi-desert climate is very important. And um, earthworms have a, a, a key role in breaking down plant matter and um, creating worm castings that are one form of humus uh, that, that is being formed in the soil. You may read now that in other climates, like in the tundra or the permafrost area, earthworms are gradually finding a foothold too. There they are not native, and there they are actually creating or uh, even strengthening the processes of climate change um, by changing the soil there in, in ways that are not natural. Anyway, I'm, I'm straying from the, the answer, but it is um, for our climates in general, uh, very beneficial to have them. And it would be great to find more studies. I would be very interested in that. Excellent. I think we have about two minutes left and I have a, just a comment and a question for you. The comment was from uh, Mr. David Walker and this was back to the soil disturbance and animal impact question. He, uh, it, he says he has to disagree with using high amounts of organic surface over 50% cover in arid areas because water from light rains are intercepted by the mulch and do not reach the ground. Also, organic matter such as wood chips are high in carbon and will lower the amount of nitrogen available to plants. Do you have anything um, you want to reply with, Jan Willem? I agree. So that uh, the, the, um, you have to uh, mulch very lightly, actually, in, in those areas so that um, the raindrops can reach the ground. And so if you cannot see any dirt anymore, then you have mulched way too, too densely. In areas where we've done experiments with that, it was very beneficial. And we got, even in dry years, uh, much higher grass and forb regrowth under the slash than uh, without it. Um, I'm sometimes concerned about uh, mastication 
where you have a very dense uh, uh, slash of uh, wood chips. And if that actually smothers the plants, you absolutely won't get good infiltration or you won't get uh, good plant regeneration. Uh, there is definitely also a problem with uh, nitrogen balance in the soil if you have too much organic matter. And so it is, it's not as simple as, as I just mentioned, but I wanted to mention it as a, uh, a restoration technique that actually does work, but uh, doing too much of it in dry areas uh, can be detrimental for sure. Wonderful. And we're actually at time. There is one more question that I think that um, we'll just leave it with you, Jan Willem, to answer maybe through an email or something. But we're at 1.45 and I don't want to take any more of anyone's time. But I just wanted to thank you and thank everyone for uh, attending and uh, going through the webinar and asking questions. And if you will uh, just reply to the email you, you will get about the survey, uh, we'll be happy to answer questions or um, if you can fill out that survey, that'd be great. And then it looks like Jan Velm's just gonna tell you, well, he's flipping through, but don't forget about the next two webinars. Be on the lookout for that. Go to the website, kibiracoalition.org backslash and Buddha webinars for the next two and sign up. And I think that's it. Anything else, Jan Boom? No, thank you very much, Adrian, and thank you all for participating today. And feel free to send me emails with uh, any questions you may have or comments. Great. Well, thank you so much, and his email's at the bottom there. Okay, have a great day. Thank you. Bye bye.